try to be as sensitive as possible to the breath. Get down to the details. Because the more sensitive you are to this one thing, the more you develop the quality of discernment that we're working on. And keep your eyes on the road. In other words, don't anticipate where you're going to go with this. Just keep following the steps, step by step, and the causes will take care of the results. It's not the case that by imagining the results you're going to get the causes to go in that direction. Because in that case, that kind of imagination would be one of the steps of the path, the right imagination. But it's not. What you want to do is develop, develop the path, develop right view. And so concentration, mindfulness, all the elements of the Eightfold Path, like we were chanting just now, are things to be developed. So where do you find the things to be developed? They're right here, right in front of your nose. And so that's where the work is to be done, not in your anticipation of where you're going to go. But pay really close attention to the breath. This is your path. And if you spend all your time looking off to the horizon to see where that big mountain is we're headed to, you lose sight of the path. You drive off the side of the road or you run into somebody. And you never get there. It's by following the path that the path develops, by focusing your attention on the breath, getting really, really sensitive right here. That that sensitivity is what's going to take you where you want to go. Because the sensitivity involves not only very clear perception, but it also involves a kind of continuity. If you really want to be sensitive to something, you've got to watch it continuously, not go skipping around. Think of a needle on a record. The needle stays in the groove, and that way you hear the, the music on the record. If the needle goes jumping around, then all you get are screeches and scratches, and it doesn't make any sense at all, and it's certainly not music. It's by staying in the groove and following each little squiggle that the record player delivers the music. So be very sensitive to the little squiggles in your breath. Keep tabs on this one level of your awareness. You begin to notice as you get more and more sensitive to the present moment, there are lots of different things that you could focus on. And it's your ability to stay focused on this one thing in the midst of everything else. That's what makes the difference. It's not like you're trying to blot out those other things. It's simply that you keep track of this one level of awareness. this one level of sensation that you've got here. It's like a radio tuning into a station. Actually, the radio waves for all the stations in the San Diego and Los Angeles area are coming through this room right now. But you choose when you have a radio. You choose which one you want to listen to. And the rest are still going through the radio, but that's not, those are not the ones you tune into. So try to be tuned in to the breath and resist the temptation to go, wandering after other things. And you find there are all kinds of things to distract you. Some of them, some of them are obvious, and you know, the chatter that's going on in your mind. You don't have to do anything with that chatter. Just keep, make sure that the main member of your committee is right here. As for the other members of the committee, they can be off in the corner talking about whatever they want to talk about. But you don't have to silence them yet. If you don't pay attention to them, after a while they'll fall silent on their own. Otherwise, if you keep running back and forth between the breath and trying to stop this thought and trying to stop that thought, the breath gets abandoned. And so instead of being concentrated on the breath, you find yourself running around. 
There's a children's game I saw one time. I was in Japan at a department store. And the department stores there, they have game arcades up at the top floor. And the children go up, and there was one of the games that was supposed to be out in the American Prairie. It was a set of holes. And every now and then a prairie dog would pop up out of one of the holes, and you were given a plastic mallet to hit the prairie dog on the head. And of course, you spent your time crazy with all these prairie, dog, prairie dogs popping up here, popping up there. Kids loved it, of course, but it was not a very concentration-inducing game. So don't go out hitting the prairie dogs on the head. Stay right here with your breath. The prairie dogs will pop up in the hole, and then they'll go away. And they'll pop up again, then they'll go away again, but you don't have to go around hitting them. You stay with this one focus on the breath. There'll be other distractions. There'll be pain in the body here or there. Again, you don't have to focus on it. Try to make the breath as comfortable as possible. You, know, you can let the pain have whatever part of the body it's going to have. You don't have to get involved. As you're working on the comfortable breath, eventually, from this point, you'll be able to spread that comfortable breath energy right through the pain. And that will help take a lot of the discomfort away right there, a lot of the tension, a lot of the sense that you can't stand it away. But in order to do that, you've got to work on your foundation here. So again, stay with the breath. Feelings of energy, rapture will come up sometimes. Again, stay with the breath. You know the feeling of energy and rapture is there, but you don't have to get involved with it. You can't take that as your object. You have to stay with the breath as your object all the time. Some people say that once the mind begins to settle down, you drop the breath and turn to a mental feeling of pleasure. Well, you abandon your foundation. And you go lost wandering off someplace else. You want to stay right here with the breath, no matter what, whether it's good or bad, or strikes you as good or bad. The things that come up in the body, you stay with the breath as your foundation. As John Fuhrman once said, this is the basis for all of our skills. So you don't want to abandon the basis. If the energy gets too strong, just think of it going out the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet. Don't try to hold it in. And that way you find it easier to stay with the breath and actually get to a more refined level of breathing, a more refined sense of the body. Visions may come up. You may see a light. You may see actually see faces or events. And again, those may be signs that your mind is beginning to settle down. But think of driving down a road. You drive down the road and you see a sign that says, Entering Valley Center. You don't get up and drive on the sign. You stay on the road. Whatever comes up in the meditation, especially as the mind begins to settle down and you know, distorted sensation of the body, sometimes the body feels really big, sometimes it feels really small. You know that that's happening, but you don't make that your focus. You keep your focus on the sensation of the breathing. Because what you want to do here is develop a real strong foundation. Because all kinds of things can come up in the meditation. And if you don't have a foundation, they can knock you away. Not just the obvious distractions like distracted thinking, any of the hindrances. Some of the seemingly positive things that are signs that the mind is beginning to settle down are things that happen in the body and the mind as the mind begins to settle down. You don't want them to distract you either. You're working on your ability to stick with one thing no matter what else happens. And again, it's not that you're denying the experience of those other things, it's simply that you're able to maintain your focus in the midst of all the activity and around you. Because it's this ability which will give rise to discernment. ability to stay right here with your foundation, you begin to see thoughts come and go. And it used to be that you would 
take on those thoughts, almost like a coat that was handed to you to put on the coat, and it becomes your, your coat. You're inside it. But this time, instead of taking it on, you sit very still and watch it come and watch it go. And so the thought doesn't take over the mind. And with thoughts of boredom, thoughts of impatience, anticipation about what this is going to be, what that's going to be, sudden insights that spring up in the mind, you have to watch those too. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're false. It's like that fox walking that the tracking book talks about. You don't want to place your weight on your forward foot until you really know that your forward foot is in a good place to have its weight placed. So you try to keep your weight on this foot where you already are. You stay with the breath. Whatever comes up, you watch it. And only if it looks like it might be a good thing to follow do you try. But even then you have to be very careful. The best thing, especially in the beginning, is to regard everything aside from the breath as a place you don't want to go. That way you maintain your foundation. We tend to think of insight practice and concentration practice as being two separate things. But where does the insight practice come from if it's not doesn't have this good foundation of stillness? Because it's only when you're still that you can see th subtle things move. So the time spent on concentration, being very careful to watch this very mundane thing, the breath coming in, going out, getting familiar with it, getting to have a sense of being at home with it, learning to make it comfortable. It's not wasted time. It's the time you, you're working on your foundation. And remember, the, the taller buildings require deeper foundations. And you're here working on a building that's really tall, so you want to dig down deep into the bedrock, so that when the time does come to build that building, it's, it's not going to fall over. Only when the mind is really still can it really see. Only when it has a foundation like the breath can it see other things moving in the mind. It's like running a very subtle experiment. It requires very precise measurements. You want to make sure that the building you're in has a solid foundation. The table on which the instruments are placed there is solidly placed. It's not liable to rock. When everything is solidly based, then you can trust the measurements. But if the table wobbles or the building doesn't really have a good foundation, then no matter how precise your equipment, you can't trust the results of the experiment. You can't trust the measurements that they turn out. Because all you may be getting is just the wobbling of the table or the settling of the building. So stay right here. It's barrowing into this point, really getting sensitive to what's going on at this point. That you gain your insight. Remember when the Buddha had his awakening, those three knowledges of the, the night, three watches of the night. First knowledge was about his own past life. Second knowledge was about the dying and being reborn of all the beings in the cosmos. Those weren't the knowledges that gave him awakening. They pointed him in the right direction because that second knowledge pointed to the whole question of karma, the actions of these beings, the views under which they acted. And so the, the Buddha turned around and looked at the whole question of action and views in the present moment. He got very sensitive to what was going on in the present moment. What does it mean to experience the present moment? Is it simply something you passively watch, or is it something you shape? And if you shape it, can you catch yourself shaping it? What happens if you reach a point of equilibrium where there's no shaping, there's no intention at all? What does that do? Where did the Buddha see these things? It was right here in the present moment, because he was very sensitive to this point. And he wasn't thinking about getting to universal compassion or universal emptiness or universal equanimity or anything. He just wanted to really understand the present moment, really see what was going on. 
And it was seeing that that made everything open up in a way that was really stable, solid, safe, secure. And it was possible to have really great technicolor experiences. But if they're not well founded, they can actually do more harm than good. There are these dimensions of the mind that you can get into sometimes when the mind is really frazzled and at the end of its rope. It can open up to, for a time being, to certain ex dimensions that are there. Tune into a radio station that is never heard before. Which has some really fantastic music. But if your radio isn't the sort that can stay on a particular station, you don't want to go there. It just flips in, flips out, and can be very disorienting. So what you want is to be really stable. It may not be as exciting, it may not be as dramatic or glamorous, but it really delivers the goods. One of the qualities I noticed immediately when I started hanging around the Thai forest tradition, getting to know the Ajans, was they all had their feet firmly planted on the ground. No nonsense, matter of fact, down to earth people. And it was this quality of being down to earth that helped guarantee the stability and safety of the practice that they were following. So the insights they gained were not in a cloud of denial or in some never-never land. They were firmly grounded in the present moment, actually firmly grounded in something that was deeper than the present moment, but was found in the present moment. And it was the quality of groundedness that was their guarantee. That when unusual things did happen in the meditation, they were able to maintain their ability to gauge those events, to see what was useful and what was not, what was reliable and what was not. So when we're dealing with our own minds, that's the same quality we want. Awakening, when it comes, is not a disorienting experience, it's the exact opposite. It makes you even more grounded, better oriented. And so the path to take you there is a grounded path as well. So we're working on the foundation. Foundation work is not necessarily glamorous work. Look here at the monastery, all the stuff that has to be done, all the infrastructure work that go, goes down into the ground. It's very difficult to get people to make donations for underwater, underground pipes, underground electricity systems. But it's essential. It's the infrastructure under the ground on which everything else is based. It may not be glamorous, but that's what guarantees that everything's going to work. So as we're meditating, we're working here on infrastructure. And even the people who work on infrastructure are not don't have the most glamorous jobs, most highly sought after social position. It's because of them that society works. It's because of your infrastructure work here that you're doing right now. This is what's going to make your meditation work. So have the pride of a good craftsman, because this is the kind of work on which everything else depends.